Sandy, thanks so much for being here. Um, welcome to an uncommon conversation. Thank you. Uh, as you know, at Common Room, or hopefully, as you know, we believe that great communities and everything that empowers them and flows from them ultimately depends on education. So super excited to talk to you today because that education encompasses so many things. It includes education for internal teams and external customers and partners, all these people in this whole, um, what did you say, landscape, right, of what happens between products and people and customers and users and um education empowers all of it. So I would love if you could tell us a bit about Skilljar and what inspired you to found it more than eight years ago now. Sure. So Skilljar, we are a customer education platform. So companies use our software to launch online academies for their external constituents. So typically customers and partners. And the goal is to drive the successful usage of those products and services um, so that their customers are successful and companies can retain and grow their customer base. And really, this came about when I left Amazon in 2013. So over eight years ago, which is a scary thought because the biggest problem I see in the world today is growing inequality and this increasing skills gap in this country, especially as we move more and more towards a knowledge workforce and continuous learning and continuous reskilling in your career. So I think it's pretty clear that the formal, say, K to 12 or K to 16 education system is great for foundational knowledge, but it's not keeping pace with the demands of the modern economy and the modern workforce. And at the same time, it is critical for businesses to drive the successful usage of their digital products and services, especially in a subscription world where if you don't use the product, you are going to churn. So, you know, this problem of customer education, it's truly, it's a triple win. Um, it's a win for customers that can actually use this amazing product they've just purchased. It's a win for the businesses that have, you know, more successful customers that ultimately drive revenue. And it's a win for society as a way to, you know, help close the income gap and the skills gap, which is getting wider and wider. Yeah, I think a, a win, win, win. Uh, if I could just make that my like bottom line, even personal slogan, like if we could all make it <laughs> a win, win, win. Um, yeah, so people get super jazzed about education for good reason, right? There's something so special and empowering about learning a new skill or learning how to apply a new skill or learning how to perform an old skill better. Um, so Skilljar has a lot of fans and champions in its own community, especially when it's centered on win-win winning. How would you describe the Skilljar community? So I have to say, I absolutely love our customers. And that is something which as a founder, I highly recommend for anybody that wants to start a company, pick customers and customer personas that you just love working and love serving every day. So our customers are educators. And so they have the soul of teachers. You know, I loved my teachers growing up and, and many of them, in fact, are former you know, K to 12 teach school teachers that have transitioned now into the private sector. So, you know, I just love being with our customers because they truly love to help people learn real skills and they love sharing best practices with each other. Um, at our annual conference, we have a wonderful education expo and the energy is just unbelievable when, you know, you know, several hundred educators get in the same room and swap stories. And um, it's just a really, really great uh, collaborative community. And it's honestly, for me, as a software person that does not have a traditional learning or teaching background, it's a real honor to be able to provide, you know, awesome software that helps these educators so they can do their best work. And this is particularly in an industry where there is just a lot of really old technology and broken promises from other vendors. It breaks my heart. <laughs> um, so how do you think about the different audiences of learners that you serve? Um, like you were talking about, you know, customers are educators and there's an interesting distinction, right? Perhaps just colloquial between like customer and community, which we might be able to get mm -hmm. into. But uh, so you provide education to employees and internal teams and to partners and to, let's say, just like maybe consulting as a consultant for customers. Do you augment your approach when you're building training and certification or training programs for different groups? Yeah, so, you know, at Skillshare, we really 
focus on product education so and external education. So largely it's customers and partners, And but you're absolutely right that in a lot of cases, um, our customers, you know, they sit in services and success teams and they're also responsible for delivering that product education to their internal go-to-market teams and employees. And so what I think is really unique about this type of training is that it's usually completely voluntary. So, and this is unlike compliance training where you have to sit through it no matter what. So, you know, when I was at Amazon, it was like, you kind of get your nag emails to complete your annual training. You're at lunch, you've got to click, you know, seven clicks on Internet Explorer and bring up this thing. And then you're just sitting there like suffering through it. Right. But you know what? You get through it. And the product education, customer education world is totally different because it is voluntary. And so. Um, so there's actually a lot of parallels, I think, with marketing, because you've got to continually earn the permission and the attention from the learners to stay engaged. So things like user experience, you know, technical deliverability, discoverability of content, and the way you market, promote, and nurture um, that through drip campaigns is really important to, to achieve the goals of the program. So um, that being said, what I found is that when it comes to voluntary learning, there's actually remarkable similarity between, say, different industries from, you know, retail to software to financial services and, you know, company sizes from a 50 person to a 50,000 person company. So um, for pre-recorded or on-demand learning, learners want to take what they call bite-sized content or micro learning these days, um, preferably video, although video is actually quite controversial in the learning world, um, but it can be consumed and resumed in chunks. And, you know, in SkillJar, we have an interactive quiz builder to test understanding. So it's very um, common, especially for software companies to kind of intersperse a set of videos of quizzes um, for interactivity, but also to get the data about did the person actually learn they were supposed to. Um, in learning theory, we think about absorb and apply. So um, as opposed to just, I don't know, reading a FAQ, you want to absorb information, but also show that you can apply it successfully um, to demonstrate the skill that um, was the objective of the module. And when it comes to live training or instructor-led training, um, what we see is that people want flexibility. They want to be offered at different time zones. They want to um, have access to a quality instructor and also have interactive components. And so it's a very different, I think, learning mindset than the compliance training where at the end of the day, the person consuming it is essentially captive. And I think the other thing which is often um, underweighted when it comes to product and external training is that customers is not like one universal amorphous blob. Um, typically, a customer base is going to include, you know, administrators, users, developers, analysts, you know, people at beginning, intermediate, advanced levels, proficiencies, maybe different products or versions of a product, and then also different learning preferences. And so any customer education program at scale does need to think about the different tracks and modalities for all of these different audiences where versus if you're just delivering compliance training, it's just like, well, here's this hour long thing and it's good for everybody. So kind of bringing it back to you, I think it's, I've been struck lately, especially how many parallels there are to marketing and thinking about the different ways to, you know, engage content so that, you know, learners, whoever they are and wherever they are can really consume the information and be successful um, in their personal and professional lives. Yeah, uh, interesting that, so we actually, Linda at Common Room uh, and I were just having a public conversation about this sort of like on public conversation on Twitter where, um, <laughs> Anyway, I had said that I feel like marketing has sort of become a dirty word in a lot of ways, but that really great marketing is actually just education at scale. Um, yes. And that, that marketing doesn't need to be a dirty word. Um, and hopefully like education and marketing can become more synonymous because what a great thing to be able to send something out at scale that um, helps other people increase their understanding. Um, so like you noted, you've worked with so many different groups, myriad industries, different customers across different um, needs. And I did a little research because I wanted to be able to say some of these pretty cool numbers behind just a few of the case studies um, that I dove into. 
Um, and so the outcomes of what you build in terms of empowering others with education at Skilljar, Zenefits reduced customer support tickets by 5% by providing customer and partner education. And Nintex increased their ARR by over 150%. <laughs> When they implemented skill jar training that is a pretty big number uh or that's a pretty big increase percentage wise and so benefits an hr focused company and uh nintex being a management and automation company like two pretty diversely separate um pathways is there any particular industry that you think benefits the most from training and certification courses that's a good question. You know, we have about 400 customers now. So in the first, I don't know, 100, even 200, I used to have all these theories and I would say, oh, you know, it's software more than hardware or it's complex products more than less complex products or enterprise or SMB or, you know, white versus blue collar or technical versus non-technical users. But all of those hypotheses have ultimately been debunked. And what I found is that if you sell any type of product, which is pretty much any company in the world, then you should offer trading. And the more users you have and the more sophisticated your product or service becomes, like, yes, I think the more valuable that scale training um, will be to the company and the customers. But, you know, we have plenty of blue collar, um, sort of low value type, um, products that training is extremely critical um and even with now the rise of plg or product-led growth you know we've had some com companies say we want every free trial user to have on-demand training because they've shown how it increases conversion so dramatically so there's really nothing that doesn't benefit from having your target users learn how to use your product more effectively at any point in the life cycle um, there are a few sub verticals that I've observed tend to embrace training more than others. And so I think it's because these are uh, sub industries that have more of a training DNA in them. So um, IT is one, security. We actually have a lot of HR tech customers, so people who sell into HR. Um, project management also, we've got a ton of project management um, software companies because that's also a discipline where, you know, training and certification are more um, established and respected as a credential. Um, weirdly, I have counterintuitively found that non-tech and sort of offline companies often tend to have more established training practices. Um, you know, before COVID, it was in the classroom. And, you know, we've got customers that sell pool products and kitchen faucets and doors and, you know, all kinds of offline items. And in, in some ways, even though, you know, the tech world, there's a tendency to think everything is self-service or our product is so easy, we don't need training. But some of these kind of older, more established um, industries, they're just much more accustomed to, you um, uh, training as, as a discipline within within their business. And even I think medical devices is another one where we have a number of medical devices and healthcare tech um, companies where even smaller companies tend to establish that training practice really early as it's you know critical to you know their go to market process and to customer success. So when you're looking at um, online communities, I'm wondering if you see a pattern of the best place or the best time in which to deliver that early education, right? So is it like the person signs up for new online digital product or software, gets email with first, like here's a bite-sized micro course like you talked about earlier, or is it actually in product where this little thing pops up or you have a hover and it can expand into a modal? Do you see any patterns about the best timing of when to, begin educating customers like within their experience of the product i have um found that it really depends on the company's strategy around training and so it's hard to say universally because even two companies that might be same size and in industry might take very different business model approaches so for example you know we have um <laughs> Uh, two direct competitors in a particular vertical, I won't mention, and one of them takes a, you know, they charge for training. Historically, training is a services um, P&L. And so 
you know, all of their training is essentially mapped to their direct sales team. Um, you know, it costs a certain amount of money, both the online and instructor led programs, you know, their competitor is taking a different approach where they give training away for free. And so, um, there are, uh, it's available to the public, you know, anyone can sign up, their certifications are paid. So they're taking a very scaled, low touch, um, low cost to the customer approach. And so, you know, even in the same industry with companies doing the same thing, we see customers um, just with different business models. So I can say it's skill jar. I mean, my personal opinion is, you know, it's, um, uh, like I said, there's no point in the journey that doesn't benefit from education. We have a very strong correlation with our prospects that engage in skill to our academy um, that then later become, you know, paying customers and then go through our own onboarding process through um, skill to our academy as well. And we actually had our mid-year sales kickoff today and our, our guest customer who comes from you know, multi-billion dollar valuation um, company, you know, it was a super high honor where she said, I took your implementation charter and took it to my boss, the CCO and said, this is what we need to do at our company, right? And so um, I think there's, uh, I think it's good across the board. And then if we think about um, some kind of physical products, hardware companies, they actually don't even know who they're, end users or community are because they sell to, you know, the purchasing departments of labs or warehouses. And so for them to be able to get their end users certified in the products, they're actually building a whole digital community that they did not have that intimacy with the customer before Skillger existed. The only times that they knew their end users were really when they filed a warranty claim or they would go on site um, because there was no kind of digital aspect to, to the product. So, I would think more about when is your target learner most engaged. I would say that in general, we find the most successful programs um, do use it as a brand building exercise, as well as that key onboarding moment when you have everybody's attention. And that onboarding moment for an account might happen once, but for users, it happens all the time. It's like we have some customers now that are five or six years into their journey with Skilljar. Everybody in the initial team has turned over. I was talking to this account the other day and I realized like, oh my gosh, I know more about the history of their program than anybody who's currently working there. And so, um, you know, things evolve and change, but there's really, you know, benefits throughout the customer journey at, at every point with training. You're like, let me give you some context. <laughs> <laughs> You've tried this before, and this is what happened. <laughs> what we've seen. Here's the. Yeah. Um, I have to say, so you had your big kickoff event today, and now you're spending time with us giving yeah. this. Thank you. I really appreciate that. All of us at Common Room and Uncommon appreciate that. Um. So as you like noted, it does seem like education now can, if it's not, should be. I would argue. The same way that I argue a community and and supporting your community and that would be an input to it through education is a brand pillar right is something that is differentiating is something that should be considered a pillar of like a company with a future <laughs> you know horizonless timeline um and so it, it, today at least in my anecdotal understanding of it more companies are building educational training and certification courses earlier and earlier right the same way that Perhaps you're launching a community before your product is totally available on the market, but you're like, we're going to start to offer educational resources or services, start connecting people so that instead of having the product and then trying to build the community, you can at least start to connect people so that people are familiar with each other and mm -hmm. with the product and the idea before, let's say something is totally publicly available. So, um, I think education is similar where you want to do it earlier. So even before community of users hits the thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, you want to educate them before they start struggling. And all of a sudden you're like, oh, we need to play catch up. They're struggling. Now we need to give education. Um, and so I'm wondering with that education as a as a part of company foundations, um, is, are, is it true that people are building this earlier in that they're better than understanding where people need or want help in the future? I'm wondering if that read is accurate. 
have you seen investment in education changing over the past eight years and, and how? Yeah, absolutely. And in fact, about a quarter of our customers actually hold this function inside marketing. Um, and that is how important education has become um, as part of the brand building process. And, and so there's a few interesting things about it. So um, education is a simultaneously very personalized and scalable experience because um, uh, you can deliver it to you know one person or to five people and you can deliver the same thing over and over especially if you use skill jar but to that one person it feels like a high quality personalized experience that's very relevant to them and so we tend to see this um I mean, across the board, but two industries in particular stand out. So one is kind of the open source developer space, because if you've got, you know, a hot new open source technology, you know, what better way to learn about that than from the, you know, company that's been, you know, helping develop it and maybe has a services model on top of that. And a lot of these companies actually drive a lot of their revenue and their business from kind of that training arm. Um, and the other, uh, sort of area that stands out to me is regulated industries. So companies where, you know, we talked about project management, but the same is also true for, you know, tax or construction or real estate. And there's a lot of in companies that sell into licensed professions and all those professionals need to get continuing education hours, get professional development hours um, every year. And so a lot of these companies have actually incorporated education into that kind of brand building exercise, because if you've got to take, you know, two hours of continuing education, well, um, it would be great to kind of learn from, you know, a cutting edge vendor in the space and actually learn something of substance. And it's fairly easy to actually get a, um, you know, a, a content or, you know, webinar um, accredited for these hours and counted. And so we see um, that to be a very effective exercise for, you know, companies that sell into licensed professions as well. Um, so, you know, and I've talked about also PLG and kind of the free trial and, you know, training is um, super effective in those in terms of improving that conversion. Um, and again, your customer is very, very engaged at that point. So I think it's incredibly effective as a marketing tip. And, you know, these days, it's not just about the product. It's not about what buttons to push and click in which order. And I actually call that more usability. And to some extent, that, sh that is a product question. I have a product management background, so I understand that very well. But customers are looking to understand the why and how of a new feature or workflow. So let's say you're a data reporting software. So maybe you have a new, you know, chart, or you might have some button changes, but that doesn't teach you about data science and data analysis and, or, um, you know, in, in the open source case, like you're not going to become a Hadoop administrator by clicking around some buttons and in a, in a product, right. And so those are some of the things that, you know, our customers are trying to drive, not just mastery of, you know, how do you accomplish this task, but what's the higher level sort of why and how behind this product. And, you know, people are really motivated by that. We have about a 50% voluntary course completion rate on our platform, like across the board. And I can tell you if it were, if it were my choice, I would not, you know, complete some of the compliance training I've been subjected to. And so people are really motivated when they can develop mastery of a particular skill or subject that's relevant to um, their careers or their personal lives. And, you know, I think usability tips alone will get, won't get you there. Yeah, there's something so powerful about being able to paint the why and the context, the landscape of what then becomes perhaps interacting by pressing buttons. But having been at AWS, right, and watching uh -huh. people use the console and you're like, okay, I connected an API, but you actually have no idea what's happening or why. Yes. That's such an experience and understanding what is being called and how that is being served and how it's like what is being connected in this landscape. And understanding that at a high level then helps you use the console, but just clicking buttons on a console will do stuff. But then ultimately you're like, I have no idea what I did. I can't repeat it. I don't know why. Right. And it's yeah, just you didn't learn anything, even though you could accomplish a task. And I would add AWS is a good example of, you know, these days there's, you know, probably a really good ecosystem of AWS trained 
developers, but in the beginning, it certainly wasn't the case. And so a lot of companies kind of coming back to the marketing question, if you have a new technology and you're selling it to a company, that company wants to know they can hire or retrain their teams to successfully use that technology. And so it has to be offered in parallel. And again, kind of these, I used to open source, but I think any other develop, developer tool or new developer technologies, you see that a lot because um, companies need to be able to uh, you know, send their teams or to hire people that have that particular skill. I mean, I think Salesforce is another one, right? If you're implementing Salesforce and you look for somebody that is trained and certified in Salesforce and um, you're for the most part not going to hire somebody off the street who doesn't have that experience to, you know, manage your Salesforce instance. I mean, yeah, you know, it's huge when you have an actual job title called a Salesforce engineer, like that is yeah. what you're picked on, right? You're like, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and believe me, <laughs> You're not going to learn how to do that by clicking around Salesforce. <laughs> right. You're going to get so lost. <laughs> I love that you're mentioning Salesforce because we're actually going to talk to Erica Cool, who was uh, who started uh, Trailblazers at Salesforce all like 11 or 12 years ago. So oh, pretty funny. exciting that both of these conversations will be happening um, across like soon, soon. Um, so let's talk timelines. Do you have any advice for an organization that's just getting started with providing education? versus one who has a foundational courses or a set educational structure, but needs to re-engage or deepen knowledge. So either A, you're starting at just starting out on this education path, trying to like help your users or protect per, perhaps like, you know, the users of your physical products even, or someone who needs to like deepen, like, you know, that continuing education type of thing. So how do you think about organizations across different matrices, like size of org, depth of educational material, needs of the customer themselves like where should organizations start what questions do they need to ask themselves to know where they are on that spectrum yeah so we have a few maturity models internally we haven't put them out there yet but it's astonishing again kind of how everybody has similar challenges so i would say companies that are just starting out and by the way there's very big companies that perhaps a particular business unit they're just starting out too so no matter the company size this can be a new initiative but Typically what we see are uh, customers will record some videos and it's pretty simple these days with screen capture or Camtasia. Camtasia is actually a great customer of ours. They have a great um, academy that's getting started with video. Um, we'll also see people in their support base, their knowledge base with a kind of getting started guide where they've kind of hacked together a series of articles that are kind of in a logical sequence so that's a very often where people start and i think this is a great place to start because making the content is the hardest part of launching an education program i mean just like marketing you've got to make the content right and so um I love it when companies, when we see a company, they've got like all these random YouTube playlists and they've got this kind of messy knowledge bank and they're like, this isn't working because they know how to create content. And, um, and the thing is like every company, maybe above, I would say maybe like 50 people, there's a lot of what I call shadow customer education going on. It's like shadow IT, if you've heard <laughs> that phrase, there's like shadow customer education and it's typically one-on-one -on -one activities where customer success managers or your support team, like it is very common for us to hear they're spending 25 to 50% of their time delivering basic training to customers. And that is incredibly costly from a time standpoint, a burnout standpoint and a customer experience standpoint. Because now when I'm asked to like schedule my kickoff onboarding training call like two weeks from now, I'm just like, oh, and then, and then I sit through it, like just wanting to get through it while eating my lunch, knowing that I'm not going to retain any of it. So there's a lot of that going on in, in companies. So this breaks when a company starts scaling and realizes usually they do not want to hire linearly with their customer base and either their customers or their internal teams are complaining about all of the kind of repetitive kind of low value tasks. So the right answer here is to take the most repetitive and time consuming training, which is usually your basic 101 and put it in an on demand format. And um, at the same time, it is important to establish that data foundation early. So you know which customers are taking it when, um, as well as how do you tie that back to your CRM? So this is where SkillJar tends to come in as the software platform of choice, because you want to take one step beyond just like some, you know, random videos and text assets being, um, 
put on the web, but actually structure that into a um, into a course, often with some quizzing and assessments, and then tie that back with data to the rest of your customer journey. And it's actually astonishing how much customers love it because I would say for for customers to get value from training, it must first exist. And we've had multiple customers that kind of they have a rolling launch where they'll just like put a link somewhere in their product or on their website and then people just like find it and i just imagine like sharks churning around like like a bleeding like piranha in the water it's like like customers go zoom because you know there's a real hunger for this material and it just gets snapped up um it usually fills this void of information and um the other thing i found is for companies there tends to be a desire for like a really high production bar sometimes on the quality and like customers do not care at all they're they are i'm speaking generally because some customers will care but in general they're so grateful for having um the training that they're so forgiving of production quality and product changes and a button moved and because remember the people that are making this training are usually like the product experts so it's not what random support rep you have it is not what random CSM you have that day. This is like a source of truth. You, The average course in our platform is about two hours long and um, the average learner takes, you know, they come back over the course of five to seven days to finish it. So it's very consumable. And it's like, it's just amazing how much people love it as soon as the training is out there. So um, another place to start in terms of topic is your customer success support and, you know, implementation teams usually know. And just saying like, what is the most, frequent basic um, questions you receive or training we can offload and that can be a real sign of a learning gap um, for us you know we to you know drink our own champagne we you know implemented skill Door academy very early in our life cycle and one of the the biggest benefits was our implementation team was like wow everybody's coming to the calls kind of like with the same base of information already because you know we require them to go through you know our first onboarding course and and you know we we work with training people, so they tend to be very like good about taking their training. Right, um, but it's it's yeah. so nice to like you know for them to get to the first call and everybody's prepared, everybody understands terminology, everybody has their like homework filled out, and it's just a great way to um, help everyone focus on the things that really uh, require live interaction. I'm just imagining say, like 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 a shark in the water, being like, is that uh, yeah, exactly. That's like so exactly. excited they're like I, <laughs> um, I would say more mature programs um these days there's like you know a few hot topics you know one is always should i be charging for training and in what types and what business models um especially with everything going digital and so what is the role of live training live training was historically pretty high cost um and you know how does that relate to our on-demand program um certification is a really hot topic right now high stakes low stakes skills based assessment proctoring part of this is being forced digitally too because in the past some of these tests could be taken in offline testing centers or at conferences where there's more like verification of identity and verification of um the authenticity of the test uh, and then localization. So you we're in an increasingly global world and um, especially for, you know, companies that are say US based, but looking to expand um, internationally. And, you know, in the past companies would typically work with local training partners to do that. But, you know, these days is everything's gotta be digital. They have a wonderful US digital training program. And so how do we create experiences for local audiences and still kind of manage that through through hq it's a pretty um hot topic with more mature programs right now yeah i can imagine that the localization thing is a is a it's like not only localized in in the verbiage right but also some of the cultural aspects too of how one receives yes. training or i can imagine there's just an endless a number of <laughs> solutions to pursue which is really exciting i hope yes yes well you know at least now um, people are thinking digitally. And so some of the cultural, um, uh, I don't want to say stigmas, but the cultural barriers, um, the US and Asia have tended to be more forward thinking when it comes to online learning. And that's a function of, you know, geographic distance, you know, perceived age bias and all kinds of things. But so these days, though, you know, companies are thinking, you know, digital first, and what does that mean? 
Um, something that we, to shift gears a little bit, something that we think about at Common Room a lot and uh, within Uncommon is that we believe a lot of people have, a lot of people who might not be in the community space now, especially because community management, community associates, community chiefs, like heads of community, um, CCOs, the, like it's only growing in the past few years. Uh, to an extent that it's becoming like a, a job title to go into. Um, and we are really excited about the fact that like there are transferable skills that people already have. Um, so many transferable skills that then they could apply to the idea of if they are interested in community management or, you know, directing communities that that makes sense. And so thinking about the importance of transferable skills and being able to self identify what might be able to help someone in their next role. I wanted to talk about your background a little bit um, because you have a super intriguing background. And for those who might not know you, you first worked <laughs> as a transportation analyst, which I think is amazing because I, I, I went, I got my master's in urban design and ah. you know, in tech. So um, I thought that was amazing. And then you went to Amazon uh, and then, you know, you've been, you've co-founded and led training education platform, which is Skilljar. And so, Taking your path as an example, although your pursuits seem like they require totally different skill sets, I sp suspect that there are transferable skills and learnings that you've brought from each. So could you talk to us about the skills from your previous roles that have served you leading Skilljar? Yeah, you're spot on that my background looks very scattered. And in fact, my joke is no matter who our customer is, I can find something in my work history that relates to them. <laughs> um, so. You know, the first thing is I just absolutely love learning. And that's maybe why I've kind of switched industries so many times. Um, I'm the kind of person I read like three books a week. I just enjoy exploring new subject areas. And when I wanted to start a company, I was thinking, what is the one thing I could do forever and be very happy? And that's learning. And so I love, I could not teach. And that's another reason why I'm, you know, so in awe of our customers. I'm not a teacher, but I do love learning. And so now I get to work in that industry while also leading a fast growing company, which itself is an incredible learning experience. So, so for me, like, and I think that's a prerequisite if you are going to try to, you know, change industries and, and you've got to be very adaptable and love to learn. And in fact, one of our core values is actually learn and adapt. So some of the other things I think that have transferred really well. So one is just a foundation on data. Um, I was a civil engineering major, which is very similar to urban planning and um, in transportation when I was there, you know, we use population data sets and forecasts, economic data sets and forecasts, really high powered modeling. Like, you know, at the time, 20 years ago, I would like set the model up and then I would go home so it could run overnight and then like come back in the morning to see the results. And this is how you forecast traffic patterns and, um, so a lot of database systems thinking and you know amazon is very similar so we had you know inventory data purchase data you know traffic data so a lot of you know problem solving skills with a, a basis of data and at, and at skill jar you know we have we actually have less data than either of those jobs but um, we have customer and product data to inform our strategy and decisions and i would say i've increasingly come to value anecdotal data um, if you have enough of it, because I think as a founder, you've got to be doing something differently and see kind of market directions and insights based on kind of your anecdotal experience. Um, so I've recently come to come to value that more. I like to think of myself as data informed, but not data driven, because, um, you know, uh, data doesn't lie, but you can lie with data. It's a great saying I've heard. Um, and then I would say problem solving. So above all else, I am a problem solver. So I just love tackling new problems, different ways, learning how other people are doing it and then applying that to the situation. And so whether I'm, you know, building traffic models to solve, you know, where should this road go, you know, building software and now building a company, I just kind of love seeing the systems view and, and getting the data and then solving that and learning something new along the way. Um, what's something innovative that you're seeing in the world of, of training and certification? So I recently spoke with um, Dana Kaweha Tableau and um, as a preview to what I'll be talking about at our in-person conference in November at Skilljar Connect um, is, is what Tableau has been doing with their program that both benefits the company but also 
benefit society. So during um, COVID last year, they actually started this amazing buy one, give one program that funds donations to less represented groups. So, so the, the bundle they've created is six weeks of online learning. It's powered by Skilljar, um, supported with a live instructor, um, a certification voucher. If you fail the exam, then you get a readout of the places that you need to study and, you know, kind of tips. And then you get a free retake because sometimes people who are new to test taking just you know, aren't that good at it, they get text, test anxiety, and that's a real factor too. And so if you buy one, they will give one to a less represented group. So some of the groups they work with are Black Women in Data. There's a group called Four Block, which focuses on veterans. And so I just love seeing our customers launch initiatives. I go back to that win-win-win where they can improve their business results, they improve the um, career trajectory of the people who are taking this training while also helping reskill our society. That is super cool. And I think in, at least in, a, in some way leads into the final question that we always uh, land with in Uncommon Conversations, which in the spirit of win, 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 um, we're always super excited to ask our experts about un, un, Uncommon Support. Um, uncommon Support is our fund because it's important to us to embody what we believe that a community is strongest when it uplifts one another. Um, so we always ask our experts to choose a nonprofit whose cause and mission they really love and want to highlight, and then Uncommon donates in your honor. Um, so I'd love for you to tell us a bit about the organization you chose to dedicate your Uncommon support to today. Oh, I love that. Like Skilljar, we're actually part of Pledge 1%, where we've, you know, it's Mark Benioff um, started that yeah. movement where we put 1% of our um, equity towards our foundation. So it's so thoughtful. So I would like to dedicate, um, this to a uh, year up. So they're an amazing customer of ours and they're an organization that is very aligned with our mission. They provide job training and corporate internships to help close the opportunity divide um, as an alternate uh, college pathway. So they're a great organization and I'm, I'm happy to support them. Love year up. I um, worked with, I used to live in Detroit and definitely worked with some year up folks out that way. Um, thank you for highlighting them, super exciting. Well, thank you so much for your time. It's been a true joy to talk to you today. Thank you.